I'm Kayla Williams, director of CNAS's Military, Veterans, and Society program. Sharpening America's strategic edge, and in particular, sustaining our military advantage, is about more than technology and budgets. Crucially, and as this Basevich Award reminds us, it is also about people. The soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen who operate the equipment and put boots on the ground are absolutely critical to our success. Both during my own time in the Army and after it, I encountered shocking levels of ignorance about uh, the experiences that our service members actually have, especially women. I had folks ask if I was allowed to carry a gun since I'm just a girl during my combat deployment to Iraq. And I had others ask if I was in the infantry at a time when that was not authorized by current regulations. To give just one anecdote of exactly how invisible I felt as a military woman, I'm going to share one short story. So my husband is a combat wounded veteran, and we rescued a dog who became, was meant to be his emotional support animal. And since, you know the joke, dogs are a lot like their owners, so our dog, uh, my husband's dog, ended up with an anxiety disorder and his own prescription for Xanax. <laughs> And one day I'm walking, uh, she, she got hit by a car, she lost a leg, so we had a three-legged German Shepherd. And I'm walking my dog in the park one day, and an elderly gentleman walked up to me and said, was it an IUD? And I said, excuse me, sir. And he said, did she lose her leg to an IUD? And I said, I, I think you mean IED. And, and no, she's not a retired military working dog. But that moment served to really crystallize for me that when most civilians think of a soldier, I'm not what they picture. So today, I'm here to go over with you what some of these perceptions really are. What do you, as national security makers and policy makers, think about when you're considering whether and how to employ the force. I believe it's deeply important for you to understand who serves in today's military and how that service affects them in the long run. So today we're going to see how much you, an audience that cares deeply about national security, actually know about who serves in the U.S. military, what they do, and how they fare when they return to civilian life. Who are the people we send into harm's way on behalf of our nation? And how do they compare to those who do not choose to serve? This is, as Richard mentioned, a different non-traditional session. My goal is for you to be engaged, to interact, and to think for yourselves as together we develop a more accurate and nuanced understanding of these topics. So get out your mobile devices, quickly download the app if you haven't done so already, open up the conference app, select the session from the schedule, and keep it out throughout my time on the stage. You can go to the live poll section of this session. Your participation is going to be vital. Also, I'm hoping it'll keep you engaged because I know that I'm the only thing standing between you and lunch. You're gonna participate by answering a series of true-false questions. And this way, I'll not only have the opportunity to share information with you when I tell you what the, the right answer is, but I'll also get to learn what topics the broader CNAS community knows the most and the least about. Your individual answers are anonymous, so go ahead and be honest about what you think is the right answer. Don't put down what you think I wanna see. There's no prize for getting a perfect score. Lunch is already free. And some of the questions may seem tricky or complicated. That's fine, just pick the answer that seems most correct. To make it easier to use the app, I've made them all true-false binaries. And don't overthink it, we're gonna be moving a little quickly, skimming the wave tops, even though each of these questions could really be the subject of its own talk. I'm gonna be addressing topics that many folks outside of the national security community don't know much about or have active misperceptions on. So if you find that you know all the answers already, I urge you to think about what you can do to educate other Americans. If there are gaps in your knowledge, think about why some of these stereotypes have taken root. I'd like you to not only learn a few facts, but also gain a better awareness of perceptions. Don't worry about remembering everything. All of this is available online later if you want to go and check the details. And if you're live streaming this at home, please feel free to play along. All right, remember, this is the only time it's not rude to look at your smartphone during a conference presentation. So if your apps are open, let's get started. First up, who serves in the 1.2 million member all-volunteer force? Am I what you imagine a soldier looks like? Let's dig into some common stereotypes and see if they're based in reality. 
join the army or go to jail. Those who have gotten in trouble with the law can join the military to avoid jail time. What do you think? Is service a way to stay out of prison? Go to that first question on your app and select A for true or B for false, that those who have gotten in trouble with the law can join the military to avoid jail time. All right. It looks like most of you know that that is false. Great job. The military runs background checks as part of routine screening of potential recruits, and almost all criminal behavior is disqualifying, with few exceptions. Next up, the military recruits heavily among the poorest Americans and represents a pathway out of poverty. Again, A for true and B for false. This is something I see on Twitter often, both from folks who think, think that it's a valuable tool for those hoping to climb the socioeconomic ladder, and among those who think that the military exploits Americans with no other options. So what do you think? All right, I can't see it very well, but that looks a little, about 50-50 split, pretty close. So the reality is that today, those at both the highest and lowest ends of the economic spectrum are underrepresented and the military draws most heavily from the middle classes. Today, only one in four young people is even eligible for military service, and some of the disqualifying factors like obesity are more prevalent in poor communities. Those who could theoretically benefit the most from serving are somewhat less likely to be able to serve. Next up, education levels. A for true, B for false, that today's service members are less educated than most Americans. What do you think? It is a trick question. <laughs> All right. So it looks like most of you know that that is false. I have had a lot of civilians ask me, though, why I joined the Army if I had a college degree. They really can't seem to imagine someone who's fairly well-educated, choosing to join, and seem to think, again, that the military is only for those without other options in life. The reality is more complicated. Virtually all service members have a high school diploma or equivalent, compared to only about 87% of other American adults. However, those currently serving are slightly less likely to have a bachelor's degree or above than other U.S. adults. However, 53% of troops list educational benefits as one of their motivations for serving, and they use their benefits at very high rates when they get out. So veterans are significantly more highly educated than non-veterans in terms of college rates. Next up, the U.S. military recruits heavily from minority populations. What do you think, A for true or B for false? Do you agree with what many in my Twitter feed believe? All right, you do not. This answer is also a bit complicated. Today's military is roughly representative in ter racial ethnic terms of the population as a whole, although African Americans are slightly overrepresented and Asians and Hispanics are slightly underrepresented. But the stereotype that the military targets or exploits communities of color is not borne out by the numbers, as most of this audience knows. So. If the military is not predominantly made up of poor, uneducated minorities and criminals, who does join? Is it A, true, or B, false, that the military draws more heavily from southern states? All right. A majority of you think that is true, which is correct. Whether it is higher exposure to the concept of serving based on the higher number of military installations in the South, and slight increased likelihood of those with a military family member to join and their station there, or some combination of factors, a higher percent of those sometime from what's sometimes called the Southern Smile because of its shape on the map do join the military. Next up, hopefully this one's a gimme. True or false, the military is made up mostly of men. Okay, I wanna know who this minority is. Um, 
All right, fascinating. Um, this, that one actually is absolutely true, uh, which m most of you knew. The military has been rep made up of about 15% of women since the mid-90s. It's crept up a little bit, but roughly sa the same, even as positions open to them has steadily increased. 100 years after the first woman was allowed to officially enlist as a woman, the first women became infantrymen. Today, no roles are formally closed to women. And despite occasional grumbling from some sectors in the civilian world, the services themselves also widely acknowledge that women are absolutely essential for fielding an effective force. So now that we've explored who serves in today's military, we're gonna dig very briefly into what they do. Snipers and Navy SEALs occupy this huge space in the public mind. Do you think those are typical military careers? First up, where do our troops serve? It's been 78 years since Pearl Harbor and 18 years since 9-11. Do you think we have a strong overseas presence? Press A for true or B for false for the statement, under 10% of the total force is currently overseas. All right, it looks like about two thirds of you roughly think that that is true, which is correct. While we have bases, engage in counterterrorism training, do other exercises, conduct air or drone strikes, or engage in combat in 80 countries, overall only about 9% of our total force is overseas. So when it comes to what kind of jobs troops have, do you think it's primarily combat? True or false, most service members' primary job is direct combat. American Sniper accurately captures a typical military job, which is why the film resonated so well. Okay. Good job, everybody. That one is definitely false. Uh, while the figure varies by branch of service, across the total force, only 14% of those who serve in 14% uh, uh, of those who serve are in combat jobs. The vast majority are in some kind of support role. The Army alone has 190 different enlisted military occupational specialties. So there's a job that would interest basically anyone who wants to serve. So. Once these folks complete their military service and re-enter civilian communities, how do they fare? This may not seem terribly important when we ponder national security, but I do believe that there is at least some truth in the quote that's often misattributed to George Washington, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional to how they perceive veterans of early world wars have been treated and appreciated by our nation. So first up, homelessness. True or false, veterans are more likely to be homeless than non-veterans. Okay, pretty even split here. Pretty even split. That one is actually true. Veterans are slightly overrepresented in the homeless population, despite the fact that the number of homeless veterans has been cut nearly in half since 2010. Worryingly, however, survey research done by Got Your Six in 2015 showed that 46% of their respondents believed that a photo of a homeless looking man without any clothing or signage identifying him as having a military connection, they believed he was more, that photo was more likely to show a veteran. So the association in the public mind of homelessness with veteran status is cemented much more uh, tightly than is shown in reality. So how about unemployment? True or false, A or B, veterans are more likely to be unemployed than non-veterans. All right, looks like about three quarters of you recognize that that one is false. There is currently no difference in the overall unemployment rate between veterans and those who have never served. In fact, for some minority groups, military service is associated with a significantly lower rate of unemployment. Veterans were more likely to be unemployed back in 2011 when that rate peaked at 9.9%. And that perception has stuck in some quarters with a number of companies continuing to roll out new uh, employment initiatives for veterans and federal hiring incentives still in place. 
Much more concerning for me today is the unemployment rate among military spouses, which DOD estimates at 25%, which is six times higher than the national average. You may have heard that the military recruits an individual, but retains a family. So what can we do to better support military families and maximize their chances of success? How about mental illness? A for true, B for false, the majority of combat veterans have PTSD. All right, a little in the middle, maybe two thirds of you think that that is false. That one is false. There are a range of estimates which vary a bit by service era, but overall it appears that roughly 15% of combat veterans seem to develop PTSD. That is a higher rate of PTSD than in the general population, but it's nowhere close to being a majority of us. However, that same Got Your Sick survey found that 83% of respondents believe that veterans suffer from mental health issues. Why does this matter? Well, even though one in five US adults experiences some kind of mental illness in a given year, and despite a lot of improvements, it is still highly stigmatized. And this misperception may be contributing to troops and veterans feeling somewhat disconnected from their fellow Americans. All right, let's move away from these negative stereotypes and on to some slightly more positive attributes. Do you believe it is A, true, or B, false, that veterans are more likely to vote? Okay, looks like most of you believe that is true and you are correct. Veterans are more likely to vote in local elections than non-veterans. Do you think veterans volunteer more? A for true, B for false, that veterans do more volunteer work. You guys are doing really well on these positive stereotypes. Uh, that one is also true. While veterans volunteer at roughly similar rates, those who do volunteer significantly more hours. All right, so we've already seen that veterans are no more likely to be unemployed. For those of us who are working, true or false, that we earn more, that we out-earn those who have never served. Okay. Kind of split, maybe two thirds think that that's false, it looks like. Well, that one is also true. On a number of key measures, including levels of education, household income, rates of health insurance, and measures of poverty, veterans are doing better than their non-veteran counterparts. Contrary to stereotypes that many hold, in many crucial ways, the majority of veterans are thriving. And this can be not despite, but because of traumatic experiences. While it was certainly challenging for me to reintegrate after my own combat deployment, it ultimately deepened my sense of connection and obligation to others. I truly believe that the concept of post-traumatic growth holds merit. There are segments of the veteran population that are struggling, and we have a national obligation to continually improve systems and services to support them. We must also balance that knowledge with appreciation for the significant benefits that the majority of veterans bring to our communities when we return and actively seek ways to enhance our ability to continue serving in new ways because we are assets. Okay, last up, very close to freeing you for lunch. How many of us are there? You may have heard that less than 1% of Americans have served. Do you believe that is true or false? This one's really pretty split. Pretty split, okay. Slightly more if you think it's true. That one's false, so I tricked you just a little. Less than one half of 1% of Americans are currently serving, but overall, veterans make up roughly, nearly 6% of the US population. However, that number is shrinking very rapidly as those who served in the major, large conflicts of the past pass on. This means that fewer Americans will have a close relative or friend who has served and can tell them directly what that service was actually like, which could ultimately have a significant impact on propensity to serve. As the number of veterans available to tell our stories to friends and family members declines, there is a greater onus on the rest of us to seek out information from them, to learn and share their stories. 
All right, thank you so much for playing. It was really fascinating for me to learn how much this diverse and engaged audience knew and maybe didn't know about who serves in today's all-volunteer force, what they do, how they fare as veterans, and again, what those perceptions are. I hope each of you learned at least one new thing, either a fact or a little bit about your perceptions and the perceptions of the broader community. As a veteran, it sometimes seems to me that civilians perceive military service in this odd arc Recruits are uneducated, poor, maybe criminals, those with no other options. Then while we're in uniform, we're on a pedestal. It's the most trusted institution in the United States. We're lionized for serving, considered heroes. And then once we leave active duty, many of those negative stereotypes recur. Veterans sometimes seem as if we're seen as sad, mad, and bad, as a British colleague put it. Seeing us through those stereotypical lenses can be dangerous for those deciding how to employ the military, which decisions to leave in military hands, and how to best support veterans. Accurate information improves our ability to make good policy decisions. Data about the growing number of women veterans and their increased likelihood of being the primary caregivers of small kids was one of the driving forces behind changing programs designed to house homeless veterans to include more supportive services for veteran families, for example. You, you just can't solve a problem that you don't understand. So as you go to the breakout sessions for the rest of the day and hear other presentations about America's strategic edge, please keep those who serve in the forefront of your minds. At least for now, we still need them, though Paul may tell us otherwise in his AI breakout session. Our military advantage is made possible by people. So it's absolutely imperative that the American population is healthy and educated enough to support great power competition, that the military is able to recruit, retain, and sustain our incredible fighting force, and that we are able to adequately care for those who shall have borne the battle when they return home. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your conference. <laughs>